um, Sid and Cheryl will be, you'll see them still, August, September, um, through the normal kind of ministry phases, and then October, November, December, uh, we won't see them much uh, because of Sid's trips that he'll be doing, and also as he kind of fully engages with that business, and it'll be a little bit of a sabbatical from church ministry, and then January, we'll see them uh, in the life of the church. That's what's happening. If you have any questions, you're welcome to come and ask me or to ask Sid. Uh, you might be thinking in your mind, like, probably there's something underneath there, something behind that. That's not, they're not telling us everything. You know, as far as I know, we haven't had a big fight. That we can't, like, work with each other anymore. The church is able to pay financially. It's not a financial thing. We've got to send Sid out to the marketplace. It's a decision of the will according to faith, what God has placed on his heart, and we're excited for what God has for you, Said, I'm a little bit sad uh, because it's uh, eight years we've been working together, and uh, the day I came into the office, Said was already there. Um, and uh, I really want to honor you, Said, for your full-time service at Redeemer Church and for all that you've brought here. Said is a lover of people, as you know. He loves young people. One of the things I love about Said is that he loves young people. Our kids, have, you know, they're fans of Said, you know. I think if uh, Sid pulls up in that old uh, Suzubaki, remember that, those of you that have been around, that thing you could hear from, you know, flick on flack when it was driving through Tamarin, and uh, even our dogs used to get excited when Sid was driving up the road, it was like a bit uh, bleak for me, um, but uh, it's really, really wonderful, and uh, also an amazing heart of reach, you know, and I'm excited for that place in the evangelism sector that you so love to be in. But the theme that I want to preach out of this morning that I'm bouncing off Sid's life is the theme of willingness. And uh, the title of my preach is Just Say Yes. Because every time Sid gets asked to do something, he just says yes. Sid, we've got a group down in Blue Bay. Will you take leadership of that group? Yes, I'll do it. Sid, there's something happening at the university. Will you take leadership? Yes, I'll do it. Sid, we need a cross on the back of the state. Yes, I'll do it. Anything Said asks, is asked to do, he just has said yes. I'm sure you should have said no sometimes, Said. But I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about the yes. Just say yes. And today we're looking at the story of Isaiah. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 6, another man who said yes. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined from a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. We have a story of the prophet Isaiah here. It's early in his ministry. Isaiah chapter 6 is a lot of chapters following after that. And uh, he's already begun to testify, begun to preach, begun to speak to the nation about God and about his ways. But he has this vision, this moment that radically changes his life. And he gives it to us in writing. And the aim of this is to kind of bring us into his vision. It's not our vision, but he takes us with him into what he saw, and he exposes his heart, what he felt and what he experienced as he had this vision of God. And I want to expound that a little bit this morning and to take some time walking with Isaiah through his vision to the place where he got to, where he said, here am I, here am I, send me. It starts with this huge revelation of God. It, it moves to kind of this sense of awareness of who he is. And then the cleansing of God that comes through the coal from the altar, and finally, this commission. So my first question to us this morning as we go through this experience with Isaiah is, have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the Lord? It's one thing to have a Christian tradition or to have a Christian culture or to grow up with a certain way of life. But it's another thing to be captivated by the majesty and the glory and the wonder of who God is. 
This moment that Isaiah had his vision is not the first moment of his conversion. It's not the time where he became a Christian, as we would call it today. He's already serving God. He's already known in the community. He's already shown some respect by those who he's ministering to. He's spoken many prophetic messages. He's been used by God, serving God in some ways. But here he comes to an encounter with God where he sees God with fresh eyes, as it were, something new in his understanding of who God is. You know, when we approach a great human being, someone who's done extraordinary things or someone who's extremely gifted, whatever they may be, a sports person or an, an artist, a creative person or a great politician, um, you know, we can be in awe of this personality that we have, but we're not tempted to bow down and worship them because we know that every human being is flawed. And some of our most kind of celebrated characters are the most flawed of characters. The ones that have like the lowest character at all sometimes have the highest profile. They're not great in themselves. They may have done great things, but now Isaiah is seeing someone who is great in himself. It's captivated by this idea that God is high and exalted, high and lifted up, he says. Here is this God who's seated on the throne of heaven. He's so bright, he's impossible to look at. The angels that are flying around his throne, they are covering their eyes and they're covering their feet and they are just a kind of in sensitive awe of who it is that they are worshiping. They won't even look at the person of God who's radiant in all his glory. And as Isaiah gets a glimpse of this picture and he's caught up into the heavenly moment of worship and the, the shouting of the angels and the crying out as they sing their songs, it's not just a loud worship session. It's not just like a concert. You know, sometimes we have these worship concerts and there are some amazing times that you can experience in worship, some emotional even moments as we experience something of reaching out to God in worship. But this is something different to that. It's something like, it's not just songs, it's something coming from the very being of the angels that is like crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They are totally captivated by the Lord of glory. Have you seen the Lord? Have you gazed upon him in the sense of thinking about his majesty and his glory and his character and the way that he's so totally different to us? That's what that word holy means. It means set apart. It means different from. It means not the same as. Not the same as you and I. Does, he's not the same as us in any single way. He does nothing out of kind of compulsion. He's not manipulated by anyone. He does only what is right and true. He's completely wise. He, he doesn't need anyone's counsel. He's totally pure. He's so completely different to us. And Isaiah's gazing at this majesty of God and he's caught up in the wonder, this is God of glory. This is the God of glory. It's a wonderful thing and it's an incredible thing. So rapturous was that worship that the Bible says the temple was shaking. The doorposts of the temple were shaking. Can you imagine yourself in that environment? Can you imagine yourself, put yourself in the shoes of Isaiah, walk in his steps? Just think, wow, this is unbelievable. And as he gets to that place of awe and wonder of God, he suddenly realizes who he is. Suddenly he comes to him that, I shouldn't be here. I should not be, I cannot be here. These angels that are so glorious that have not sinned like we human beings have done, they can't even look at the throne of glory. What am I doing here? He says, woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined from a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Just as clear as his vision of God is, just as wrapped up as in this awe and majesty, suddenly he's got total clarity about the humanity of his own flesh. Just as the temples are being shaken by the sound of angels worshiping God, it's like his inner core is being shaken with the reality of, I can't be here. If I stay in this place, I'm going to die. I can't be here. He's too pure. He's too holy. He's too magnificent. You know, when you go through a, a shock experience as a human being, 
They say that your mind slows everything down. It's like you're going through things in slow motion. Have you heard that? Or maybe you've experienced it yourself. Being in a car crash and you, you see in slow motion another car moving and spinning. You see in slow motion as some piece of metal flies across the road. And it's amazing what the brain does when it experiences a moment of shock. And I'm amazed that what Isaiah does is he goes through this shocking revelation, who God is and who I am. His mind takes him to his mouth, my lips. I shouldn't be, I'm a, I'm a person of unclean lips. That's what he focuses on. That's where his mind takes him as he walks through this slow motion experience of the wonder of God and the reality of who he is. What comes out is, I'm of unclean lips. I, I speak on behalf of God. One minute, I'm telling his message. The next minute, I'm abusing some other human being made in the image of God. I raise my voice in worship, but at the same time, I use my language. I curse. I curse. I use my tongue for cursed language. Sometimes I use my tongue to build people up, but other times I deliberately pierce somebody. I hurt them on purpose with my lips. Sometimes I just let my lips run. I don't keep control of them. I just let my tongue say whatever I, I feel in my heart and I don't hold back when I should have held back. Sometimes I, I should keep my silence, but I don't. I, I let a rumor flow through my lips and keep going and keep going and keep going. And if I held my lips, the rumor would die with me, but I just let it go. My lips are unclean. I use my tongue to protect myself. I don't protect others with my tongue. And suddenly he sees himself as this flawed human being and it's all focused at the moment on what he uses his tongue for. And it's not just me, Isaiah says. I look around me and that's the nature of the human race. That's what we're all like. The whole of human society has been destroyed by the tongue. Families have been destroyed by the tongue. Nations have been destroyed by the tongue. Businesses, universities, no matter what you call it, we have the capacity using our tongues to cause such damage. We use our tongues to lie to one another. We use our tongues to speak to one another, but then we won't raise our voices in prayer. We use our tongues in all kinds of ways to bring about a destruction. We flatter each other, but then we betray each other when we're apart. We make promises that we've got no intention of keeping. We break down the fabric of society by this use of our tongue in such a way. And Isaiah is, is deeply impacted by it. He sees this king of glory and he looks at himself and says, I am so unclean and my people are so unclean. There's nothing we can do about it. Here I am. There's nothing I can do to fix it. And as he sits in that tension of who God is and who he is, he sees the seraphim, the angel, gathering a coal from the altar and bringing it to touch his lips. With it, he touched my mouth. And you see, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. It's so important that we, we know that God is not like a God who just says, oh, shame, Isaiah, you're feeling a bit guilty. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. He doesn't just like gloss over it and say, let me, let me make you feel better even though I'm not addressing your problem. God is not like that. You see that God actually addresses the problem. He, he takes that call and he applies it to Isaiah's lips. I don't have time to teach on all the kind of doctrines of the altar and all these things that happen, but just simplistically, the altar is where the sacrifices are made. Make a fire, sacrifice an animal. It's representing the animal dying on your place, in your place, dying for sin, pleasing God that a sacrifice has been made. It's this place where sin is dealt with. And what God is doing in that moment with Isaiah is saying, I'm taking that, that benefit, that blessing, and I'm applying it to your life. I'm not just applying it in general. It's not just that I'm saying, well, you're a sinner, and now you're forgiven because here yeah, the altar is doing its job. No, I'm taking that sacrifice, and I'm applying it to your specific sin. What you have said from your mouth, this is my struggle, this is my fault, this is my problem, God. I lay it here before you. I'm forgiving you by cleansing you of that sin. 
And the problem with us so often is that we kind of develop this generic idea of sin. General terms, you know, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, Jesus died in my place, therefore everything's okay, and that's all true. But God is wanting to address specifically the sin of your life. It doesn't help because we, 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 we just deal in generic terms because we don't deal with who we really are. We just kind of gloss over it in our mind. Okay, I'm a sinner. I know God, I've sinned with my mouth. I've sinned with my mouth, the things I've said and the things I haven't said. I've sinned, God, with my mind, the things that have passed through my mind. I've sinned in that way. God, I've sinned with my attitude. I've sinned with my, my rebellion to my parents. I've sinned, God, because I didn't do something that I promised to do, and I've been unfaithful in that way. I've been a, a breaker of trust. I'm, I'm sorry for that, God. And the moment of salvation or the moment of forgiveness is when God takes that sacrifice for sin and he applies it to the specific things that we repent of and he says, be clean. You are totally clean. I think it's so important that we come to a place where we pass through that experience. So many of us grow up in some kind of a Christian background, some kind of a Christian tradition. And we just get caught in this kind of general momentum of relationship with God through the general practices of Christianity. But God is so personal, and He's wanting to do something personal in your life. And He's wanting to change not just your category from sinner to righteous person, but He's wanting to cleanse you from the sins that you've done and make you clean and pure and right before Him. What an incredible journey Isaiah goes on. The coal touches his lips and the effect is immediate. Listen to what the angel says. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Not Isaiah, okay, now here's your period of testing. You know, touched your lips. Let's see how you do this time. Isaiah, I've touched your lips. Your sin is taken away. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. How beautiful is that? Let me ask you this morning, have you been cleansed from your sin? Have you seen God? Do you know who you are? Have you been cleansed of your sin? Have you put yourself before God like Isaiah did? I'm a man of unclean lips. What is the prayer that you've prayed to God? Isn't it worth doing something personal, something deliberate, something intentional, something specific? God, cleanse me in this area of my life. Have you been cleansed? And then he hears the voice of the King of Kings. In the presence of heaven, the sound of angels, the deafening sound of worship, this moment of personal intimacy where God touches his lips, and the next thing, he's in the presence of the one on the throne. He's close enough to hear his voice. It's a picture of God speaking to himself, the Trinity. Who will we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah's been brought right in. He hears this voice. Every barrier between us and God has been broken down. Everything that keeps us at a distance has been taken away. Everything that prevents us from hearing His voice has been dealt with. We can be in the presence of God and hear His voice. It's so intimate. It's so personal. Here today we hear God's voice sometimes, often through the scriptures, like I'm preaching from today, through this scripture, hopefully we're hearing the voice of God. Sometimes it's through the words of a song, sometimes it's the words of a friend, sometimes it's a thought that just pops into our mind, sometimes it's our own prayers. So many ways that God speaks, but always God is speaking. And as we pass through this journey of knowing who He is and, and understanding something of ourselves and being cleansed of us, and we put ourselves in a position 
to hear the voice of God. What is he saying to you? And Isaiah, as he hears this voice of God, it's like there's this overwhelming, compelling response. He can't help himself. Here I am. Who shall I send, God is saying. Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do whatever it is. I don't even know what it is. I don't even know where you want me to go. I don't even know what you want me to say. I don't know what it's going to cost me or what the impact will be for my life. It doesn't matter. I'll do it. I'll do it. Something about hearing that voice of God that is so compelling. Think about the disciples as Jesus was beginning his ministry and just the early days, I mean, hardly anything known about who Jesus was. A little bit of teaching, some evidence of his miraculous power, his baptism, things like this. And he's saying to disciples, come and follow me. And they give up everything to follow him. They leave their fishing nets, said. Not, you know, sometimes you have to leave that net. You know what I'm saying? Not every day. They left their net there to follow him. They did it immediately. They didn't think about it. They didn't hesitate. Just there's something compelling about the voice of God. When he speaks, it's like, I want to do it. I will do it. All through the Bible, there are stories of people who've done that very thing. Just said yes. Build me a knock. Yes. What does it mean? I don't know. What's it going to cost me? I don't know. I'll do it. Joshua, cross the Jordan and take on Jericho. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. All through the ages, down to today, Seth is saying, yes, I'll do it, God. Feel like you're calling me into this space. I'm going to do it. Yes, I'll do it. My question to you and to me this morning is, where are you on the journey? Where are you on the journey? Because we all need an encounter with God that changes our perception of who He is and what He can demand of our lives. We're not, it's not going to be good enough just to live in a Christian tradition. It's not going to be kind of a motivating factor if we just kind of want to live a good life or an okay kind of existence, do more or less what's good enough. There's this moment that Isaiah has that I believe it's available for all of us, this journey for all of us. If we could put ourselves in a position to just consider God, Lord, show me who you are. When I read this text in Isaiah, I don't just want to read it like words on a page. I want to be caught up into the scene. I want to imagine myself in the presence of the King of glory with the temple shaking and the angels covering their faces and crying out, holy, holy, holy. And when I've experienced that fully, I want to know who I am. I don't want to be just, you know, a mask in front of myself. So even when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't see who I am. I want to know who I am. I want to be able to put myself before you. I want to be cleansed of my specific sins and things that I've done and haven't done. Father, cleanse me and call me so that I can say, yes, Lord, to whatever you want me to do. I hope that we can all take that journey together. Is that okay? I'd love to pray. What I'm going to do is pray. And while I'm praying, perhaps the worship team can come up because we're going to close with a song. And so while they come up, why don't you just bow your heads and then we'll close with a song of worship. So Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this moment that Isaiah had where he suddenly saw you. And it makes us feel sometimes, Lord, like we take you so lightly and just pass through life as though, you know, you're just someone we talk to and you're powerful, but not someone that we're in awe of with the very essence of our being. And so, Lord, when we hear Isaiah's words, we ask you to show us more of yourself that we also might be caught in awe and wonder at the glory of who you are. Help us to hear the angels' voices as they sing, holy, 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 over and over and over again, saying, you're not like us. You're not like us. You're not like us. 
You're different to us. You're pure in every single way. We can't even look at you because of the light of your glory. Help us to understand and to know you in that way. Teach us to judge ourselves right, Lord. To know who we are. To confess our sin truly. Not just a little sorry this morning for whatever I've done yesterday. and You know, I'm sure I'm doing okay. Help us, Lord, to take our sin seriously, to confess it. I'm sorry for this sin. Help us to receive that forgiveness that is so, so powerful. That in a moment you can apply the sacrifice of Jesus to who I am. And make it okay for me to be in the presence of the living God. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear that call. Help us to respond with the enthusiasm of Isaiah, even if we don't know what it's going to cost us. Yes, yes, I'll do it, God. Yes, I'll do it. We ask you to help us to live in that story in the name of Jesus. Amen.